I was like, have you done any deals that, like that I would have heard of? And he's like, you know, Disneyland. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, a lot of windows in Disneyland. We do all the windows in Disneyland. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh my God. Like, okay. They bought a window company, got them a Disney contract. <laughs> we do all the windows at Disney. <laughs> All right, what's up? We are talking about something pretty special. This episode, this is going to be different than our normal episodes, which are, you know, freewheeling, freestyling. Today, we got a plan. And the plan is we're going to talk about companies that crush it with only one or two employees. So the reason we thought about this was there was some news, I don't know, a couple weeks ago that a company that I had never heard of called Wargraphs sold for $54 million. And the yeah, that's, I mean, that's obviously impressive, but the most impressive part was that Wargraph was just one dude. So one guy sold his company for $54 million. And, uh, I don't know. Do you know what Wargraphs did? Are you no. familiar with it? Is it a, a gaming thing? It's a gaming thing. Yeah. So he built basically a companion app, I think for uh, league of legends. So if you play league of legends, this was like a thing that would keep track of your stats and stuff like that, help you get better at the game. So he built this little companion app and, uh, it had gotten really popular. I think he got into like a million uh, players that used it and was generating serious revenue. And so he sold it for 54, 54 million in cash. And he was up front. He was like, I got half of the, uh, sorry, I got half of the 54 million in cash up front. And I have the other half as like my earn out that I have to, you know, like, you know, if it hits, you know, our milestones along the way, which is just super impressive for a one person company. And how old is the person? Uh, I think he started when he was young, but now it's been like, you know, seven or eight years. So you know, probably, Dude, that's amazing. Um, I'm going to guess something like 30, but, the the it got me thinking. It was like everybody talks about big businesses for good reason. Big businesses are awesome. Uh, they, they are. But what about mighty businesses? What about the 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 guys who are punching above their weight? So somebody who has just themselves or just one or two people that does millions in revenue profitably flies under the radar. And like, how many other war graphs are there out there? So we did some research and we found some. And so that's what this episode is going to be about. And we've kind of touched on this before. We've done some of our most popular episodes. If you go on YouTube, you'll see the episode with Peter Levels, I think has a couple hundred thousand um, listens. The lesson, uh, the, sorry, the uh, episode about Amit Agarwal, the guy who builds uh, G Suite, you know, basically like Google Sheets plugins. Um, he does millions of dollars in revenue as just kind of one guy who is a blogger turned app builder. And so those have been some of our most popular episodes. So I think this is going to be a good one too. Sam, anything else before we jump in? Yeah, I want to give an honorable mention to this one person. Have you listened to Juvenile growing up? Remember rapper, <laughs> the rapper Juvenile? Of course. You're giving him a shout out like he's listening? <laughs> yeah. I, like last year, NPR, they do this thing called the Tiny Desk Concert Series. You know what that is? It's like they're in the office like playing acoustic songs. Yeah, those are cool. They said, who should we have? And this one guy goes, you should have Juvenile. And Juvenile <laughs> replies and he goes, what the, what the, he goes, WTF, what, what the F is a tiny desk and hell no. And <laughs> you know what? They got him to do it anyway. It happened this weekend. <laughs> and so in preparation for this one man band show, I've been listening to that Juvenile concert <laughs> at the Tiny Desk NPR series. It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> he, he, you remember back that ass up and yeah, slow motion for me and all that? <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. I had to be inspired. Him and Manny Fresh did it. And it was awesome. It was awesome, awesome, awesome. So honorable. All right, so these are, the tiny, these are the Tiny Desk Awards then. Let's call it that. <laughs> these are the Tiny Desk Awards, which are the, the, the businesses that can be run off of one tiny desk because it's just one or two people. All right. And uh, we're going to do this like an award show. So we have a long list, but that'd be kind of boring. So we're, we broke it up into categories and we each have our answer for the category. So for example, first category is going to be biggest one person business. But we also have to set some rules here. Yes. Some of these things, one person, it's a bit uh, vague. Yeah. One person oftentimes can mean like the founder and like a team of contractors or in many cases, it's going to be um, uh, agencies that they work with. Of course. Or it started as one person and it was that way for a long time and then they hired a team. Um, exactly. So, so it's more of the spirit of the law than the, than the letter of the law here. So, you know, they don't have t-shirts for the company because, you know, 
there's, they don't have like you know a bunch of employees and and uh, you know morale. They they probably won't have a uh, an office where, where a bunch of people go into. It's either one or two people who are kind of the core drivers, and maybe they use some contractors or vendors or agencies for for other things. But uh, that's that's generally the the way we're looking at this. Yeah, and so uh, let's get into it. So what's the first one? The uh, biggest is it the uh, the biggest? So you go first. So. I'm going to do one, another gaming one that, that I doubt you know of. Do you know what Stardew Valley is? No, what is that? So Stardew Valley is this game. And if you look at the game, the game art looks like it's like 8-bit art. Almost it looks like a very, very simplistic game. And it was made by one guy, this guy, Eric Barone. And he basically is like, you know, I'm. he gets out of school. He doesn't want to get a job. So he's like, well, I, you know, I'm going to teach myself how to code uh, instead of going to get a good job. So he's like, why don't I learn how to build a game in order to teach myself how to code? Like, I don't want to just code for coding's sake. I'll try to do something with it. And he always liked these games back in the day. I don't know if you know Harvest Moon. It's like this kind of like farming simulator game. Um, these like very simple kind of like, uh, you, you know, it had like a cult following. And so he's like, I'm going to make my version of Harvest Moon, which was like kind of was popular when I was a kid, like, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And um, so he spends basically... Uh, four years in solitude, just building this game by himself before he releases it. For four what years, was his every- job. Did What's he that? have a job? He j- he Did just he lived off his girlfriend. His girlfriend had a like a, a grad degree stipend, and uh, and then he had a part time job as an usher. <laughs> God damn, <laughs> which is amazing. I mean, an usher is a terrible. I mean, unless you're literally trying to be like a cover artist covering the artist usher like you, you never want to be an usher that's not the that's not your career's not going the right direction when you're doing that um so anyways the he, he launches this thing stardew valley has sold 20 million copies um it sells for 13 dollars a pop and so uh you know he sold this thing i think over time it has done 150 million in sales wow. or revenue um and he's the only guy who built it just by himself which is Honestly, not that uncommon. Minecraft was largely built the same way. There's this guy, Notch, who was the developer behind Minecraft. And if you've ever seen it, he'll get on Twitch and he'll just code Minecraft. Like he'll just stream himself for like 12 hours just building the game. And like I think Minecraft had more people overall, but like one guy was really the driving force and the driving energy around it for many, many years. Uh, but Stardew Valley is my pick for, for biggest 150 million off of one, one game dev. The guy Notch, when he sold, I think he sold for like multiple billions, yeah, right? Three billion, two billion, something like that. And he, uh, I think he bought like an, like he outbid Beyonce for like an eighty million dollar mansion <laughs> in uh, L.A. And he was tweeting out or sharing how everyone hates him now. He was like, "I'm so lonely. This sucks." But he's still in this like fancy eighty million dollar mansion. Do you remember that whole like ordeal where he was talking about how? He like didn't give equity to people, and so some of the people who he hired uh, hated him and. He was lonely, but he was, and he was having all these huge parties, and he was lost, and all that stuff. Do you remember all that? <laughs> no, I, I missed all of that, <laughs> dude. He like went through this whole spiel on on Twitter about how like he hates his life. But oh wow, amazing. you know, I mean, this whatever. house is. Uh, I'm looking at this house. This house is insane. Was it eighty million? Seventy million. Yeah, it was like a. It was a fat. I remember like he. It, I, like, I would love to just see Beyonce getting the news. It's like, oh, who who did it? Who outbid me? Was it was it Spielberg? Who was it? Oh no, it must have been uh, Lenny Kravitz. Who who was it? Who who, who outbid me on this? It's like Notch, M- Notch. <laughs> like, yeah, got him. <laughs> got him. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, mine is uh, Streamyard. So Streamyard, I have to uh, remember when they launched, but I think they launched in 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And it was basically a it was a way to stream events online and stream interviews and things like that online. These two guys scaled it to $30 million in revenue in one year or 18 months or so. And this mostly happened because of the pandemic. They ended up selling it to Hopin for $250 million. It was a mix of cash and stock. And Hopin ended up laying up off a bunch of people uh, like last year. But I've heard rumors that it's killing it. Have you heard these rumors? Hopin? Yeah. No, no, I have not heard. I've heard the opposite of those rumors, but I don't know. What have you heard? Well, just like when the layoffs happened and it was like basically post-COVID, events came back online, like in person. So that's naturally going to hurt the business. Then they had massive layoffs. And I heard that the 
the founders have taken a ton of secondary or something like that. So I heard like a hundred million plus in secondary. Yeah, but maybe the business doing well. I have no idea. I just heard kind of like the generally though when you hear those three things, it's like massive layoffs, you know, market, uh, you know, the, the the crazy event that was driving your growth has stopped. And the founders took, and people start talking about how much secondary the founders took. It's usually because the business is going in the wrong direction. You, usually people don't bitch about secondaries when the thing is exploding. I don't know. I, I heard the other way. I, I also thought that. And I heard the other way around. We talked about StreamYard like right when they were getting going. And then we talked about them again when they were acquired. Did you say you knew these guys? I think I had met. Because back when I was doing video streaming, I met like kind of everyone in this space. I, I, I don't know. I got to look up who these guys are. But I do know that they got to $14 million in ARR when it was just the two of them. And then it got to 30 million when they had, by that time they had hired up a team. So this is kind of like a hybrid. They got, they got really far with just a couple of people. And then they hired up, um, you know, from, from as, as they scaled it before they sold. And I remember going to their website when it was just them, and I there was like the founder, and he w- he was on the he was on the homepage, and he was giving like a tutorial video on how to use the product, and it was just him like with his camera on his lap practically, and he looked exhausted, he looked so <laughs> worn out. I remember this during the pandemic when we were thinking about using them for something, and he looked ig- like super haggard, but it was very impressive that these two guys have built this to sell for two hundred fifty million dollars, and I, although it was cash and stock. So I don't know if the stock is worth anything. I heard it might be. So that might be one of the biggest ones that I've heard of, at least recent big ones. Another big one that uh, it, it happened a long time ago, so I have no connection. It was Plenty of Fish. How much did Plenty of Fish get acquired for? Like $550 million, I yes, think. Yes, hundreds, yeah. And uh, that was started by one guy named Marcus, who now I see online, and he seems like he like lives the most lavish life and just does crazy shit. <laughs> and so Plenty of Fish was basically one of the early dating websites. It was a marketplace. It was oh, like OK Cupid, but I think it was predominantly Canadian. And that had to be probably the biggest exit that I've ever heard of for uh, a really small, small team. Yeah, Plenty of Fish was unbelievable. That guy, isn't he like a nut, the Plenty of Fish founder? I feel like that's a whole another story we should do one day. I think it's a whole another. I think I don't know. I haven't researched it enough to actually like verify the claims, but I've heard like a little like grumblings, like a little little stories that something weird is going on, but I don't know the truth. <laughs> also, I love the fact that you've met the StreamYard guys and they looked haggard and you're like, it's like in Silicon Valley, when you see somebody like that, you put your arm around them and you're like, hey, you all right? Is it is it because of too much traction or not enough? I just need to know how I'm going to treat you. It too much. From, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's too much traction? Okay, okay, okay. Come here, come here. You sleep on my couch. Let me feed you. Just take this check. Put me on your cap table. Uh, you know, like there's, there's really, you know, one out of 10 of the haggard people, they're getting beat down by too much demand and nine out of 10 Who are Who have you no met demand. like that? <laughs> who have you met like that? Who else have you met? Where you're I just remember like, talking to a guy who, um, this guy, Abder, I met a guy, Abder, and he was doing something pretty, uh, I met him after the fact, but he told me the story and it, I always, it always stuck with me. And I always remember here after hearing the story, I was like, I should look for that. So what happened was Twitter started taking off in popularity, uh, right when it kind of got going in Silicon Valley, like it became like a thing. And Abder was him and his team, or they're like, kind of like data science type people. And so they were like, all right, what can we build uh, that makes Twitter work better? Because Twitter was such a simplistic product. And at the time, it was like almost like a protocol. Like anyone can kind of build apps on top of it or use the data for something. So he's trying to build something and he doesn't know what he's doing. He's like, he's sitting on a train and he starts coding this thing. He's like, oh, I, I had done this research on sentiment analysis. And he's like, I was like, okay, so you know, well, well, this story sounds a little bit boring. Who cares about sentiment analysis? He's like, yeah, you could, he's like, you could figure out like how people are feeling about a certain topic because they're talking about it in a certain way. So he's like, did so you I'm, tell him his story was boring right when he got well, going? Well, my, you know, my the chin, Bored. The chin started to drift. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I was like, is there anyone else in this car I could talk to? I was in a car with him in Ethiopia, you know, for four hours straight. I, there's nowhere to run. So I'm, I'm hearing, uh, I, I'm like, all right, let me hear out the story. Sentiment analysis. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me more about your PhD in sentiment analysis. What did this do? And he's like, <laughs> so I was on a train and I'm building this thing. I'm trying to analyze what people are saying on Twitter to see if I could get the sentiment, the current mood or whatever. He's like, but then I realized, actually, what I'll do is I'll, instead of figuring out their mood, I'll just figure out what are they talking about a lot of, like a lot more than usual. That's kind of interesting. And he basically created trending for Twitter off of Twitter. Oh, cool. So he, he's, like, he's like, oh, I could figure out that the word Olympics normally is only said this much, but it's being said 10 standard, standard deviations more. So that means Olympics is trending, that it's, it's above its par. And he's like, this is super cool. Like, 
I basically have the 10 things that people are talking about on Twitter. I can kind of get that, I get that signal in a way that you couldn't really get at the time on Twitter. And so he creates this and they create a separate website off of Twitter called Twitter trending. I forgot what what it was called. It's his own website. And they start getting millions of hits on this thing. And they're just trying to, and as, and he's trying to keep it, keep it up because he's basically drinking from the Twitter fire hose and he's got all this traffic. And so he's trying to keep both of them working. Eventually Twitter buys them. So they become like employees 10 through 20 or something of Twitter. Oh, sick. And at the time Twitter had the fail whale. It was just like, constantly Twitter that the service was going down. It was had so much usage and it was like in this web 2.0, it was like wh- it wasn't like scalable yet. They hadn't figured out how to scale it. And he's, he told me, he's like, he's like for six months, he's like, I just woke up every day with like an imprint of my keyboard on my forehead. Like I had just passed out. I was working, trying to keep this damn site up, pass out, wake up. Oh, uh, where was I? And I just kept going. He's like, that was six months straight of my life. He's like, I've never experienced anything like it. And at the time, I remember thinking, oh, there's levels to this thing. Like, that's what it feels like when you really have one of the winners. Like, and, and if you talk to people early at Facebook and they talk about like what the, what, what it was like working early at Facebook, Facebook, it's like when people talk about living in New York, they're like, just the energy was, it's just, the energy. you can't explain it. <laughs> and it's like, that's how, that's what you get when you're inside one of these generational companies at the early stage when they're, they're scaling too fast. Dude, that's exciting. I love that one. Um, I like hearing those old stories like that. I always read those old books, like the, the hatching Twitter and all that shit. I love that shit. Yeah, me too. Um, all right, next. Let's category. go to di- let's wait. Let's go to a highest degree of difficulty. We'll skip a category and come back to it. Okay, so this is the hardest one, hardest example, the one that we're like, how the hell did you even do that? And there's no way anyone else would have done this. You go first. All right, I have one. It's called Tiny Wow. So I think the URL is just tinywow.com. So do you have that pulled up, Tiny Wow? Yeah, got it. All right, so I met this guy. He's a member of Hampton. That's why I met him. His name's Evan Gower. He had a, uh, a, a another website called Tech Junkie. Maybe you heard of Tech Junkie, but they like just talked about like tech topics, whatever. It's a pretty normal website, but he ended up selling it for eight figures. And on the side, he started this thing called Tiny Wow, which is a bunch of tools that include like how to convert a PDF, but then image editing tools that use AI. And it's one of those websites where you Google like convert this file to PDF, it is able to, he's able to come up first. Right now it has 6.6 million visits a month. And insane. the reason it's, in, yeah, it's insane. The reason it's interesting is right now it only does 20,000 a month in revenue because he says, I haven't, I just haven't turned on any of the um, monetization. It just has like uh, little ads. He goes, I'm going to turn it on eventually. But right now I'm just enjoying the summer and time with my family. So I haven't really like <laughs> dug deep and like built it. And so basically, this guy, Evan, he was... Bitch, you're talking about the weather? Put on AdSense. What are you doing? (laughs) Evan, this is insane. (laughs) Dude, that's the cool part about uh, these one-person businesses. And this is uh, another guy who I'm going to tell the story about has said the same thing. He goes, I felt like taking the summer off, so I just let (laughs) let it ride for a little while. Uh, So this guy, Evan, he basically had a history as a, a, a developer. He says he doesn't do any development now, but he has a team of three people who are helping him, or one contractor who helps him with uh, overseas, who's helped him actually like build it, implement. And he basically just draws it and designs it. But the reason why this thing has taken off is if you Google, or do you remember, like, do you ever see those videos on TikTok that say like, here's five websites that should be illegal, but aren't? Yeah. So good that they should be illegal. <laughs> yeah, what it's like headline. a shtick. <laughs> so that is basically how it, the, the website got popular is it's gotten popular from those videos. And so the reason why this is really hard to create because A, getting traffic to a, 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 like a content site or any type of website like this, it's very challenging. Oftentimes, building the product is not the hard part. It's getting users. Uh, and getting 6.6 million visits a month, mostly from social, quite challenging. We'll see if he's able to turn this. But I asked him, I was like, how big can this get? And he's like, well, like I think of like Canva. So I'm like, can we, I think it can make tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue because we're going to ultimately, we have this traffic. We can have like a feature that says, hey, you can edit this uh, picture using our platform and we'll charge a small fee. I think this actually could be a big business, but right now it's really tiny. He told me it costs $10,000 a month to run and it's making $20,000 a month in revenue. Wow. Yeah. Do you know how much, uh, how much remove that BG makes? Who? Do you ever use remove.bg? No, what is that? Oh, that's, I mean, that, is the, that was the old way. It's like, if you need to remove a background from an image, like you need to just cut out the object and remove the background. Remove.bg was this Shit. website that was uh, like just the Look go-to. Look at the traffic. 
it, yeah, it was just a go to and uh, oh my god, fifty to sixty million in monthly monthly visits. So it's just like insane. And remove BG, it just had a stranglehold for me at least on on doing this. It was like super quick. You just drag your image in, it just removes the background. Boom, there you go. And uh, and then they charge for like you know you want it like 1080p or whatever. They started charging for like little things like remove this watermark and. Um, I'm sure this thing crushes, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how much uh, revenue they do now, but I'm sure this is one of these like mighty businesses where it's a very small team. Uh, here so we I just go. Googled it. Canva acquired it says them. It, Canva acquired them. It says that they had at least a hundred million people coming to their website last year. Yeah. Um, that's a, cr- that's crazy. So it was acquired by Canva. So you can probably, I don't know if Canva has gone public yet. Maybe they have, I think actually they just did a last month. You might be able to dig through their numbers and see if they got acquired and for how much, but that's crazy. That's so much traffic. This site, tiny wow, definitely could be something like that. They started this in 2019. Um, it's this company, uh, Collideo. Um, and then they, so they started in 2019. They sold it. This was. 2021 so two years later for roughly a hundred million dollars wow and uh wow do they have funding i think the parent company it looks like it's a side project of the parent company the reason why i said these are the hardest to make is getting that scale of traffic that fast is so challenging you know like there's a lot of like software products that we're going to name as one person companies and that's challenging in the sense of like you have to put it in a ton of hours uh and you actually have to like invent stuff and that's very challenging but Getting traffic to me is more of an intellectual challenge, or it's like I have no idea like where to start. Like, with, whereas with starting with software, it's like I oh, I'm gonna make this one feature, then I'll do this other feature. I'll talk to my users. It's a little bit it involves a little bit of luck, a little bit of skill, but right. getting a lot of traffic to your website early on, I think there's less people that know how to do that, and so that's why I think that this is one of the harder things to start. So here's my my answer for highest degree of difficulty: Photo P. So Photo P is very very similar. Basically, it's one guy who recreated the entirety of Photoshop in a web browser for free. So, oh my God. Like, Photoshop is one of the most complicated products in the world. He c- recreated it by himself, gives it away for free, and made it work in the browser, which Photoshop doesn't. Photoshop is, a, you, know, you have to download the app in order to make it work. It's just remarkable. The guy barely monetizes it, uh, doesn't want to sell it. And uh, if you go just search his like, just search Photo P Reddit um, or like, you know, founder Reddit, he goes and he talks about like, you know, why he built it, how he built it um, and what, you know, how he thinks about it or whatever. It's pretty insane. And I think how much traffic does it get? uh, Traffic wise, like 13 million, according to similar web per month. And um he does at the time. This was a couple years ago. He said that he was doing a hundred thousand a month um, off this thing, and it was like literally from the most basic, absolute most basic of uh, of like ads. Like this is one guy Ivan who made it, and it's, he just like puts like the very simple banner ad on the site and makes like a hundred hundred thousand dollars a month. He uh, did a post at Hacker News on April 11th, 2021. He goes, Hey guys, I'm Ivan. I'm the creator of Photopy. I made almost a million dollars in the last 12 months, 90% from ads. The rest is from premium, uh, which is users who pay to hide ads. So it's not even much of a premium. <laughs> when you start your own project, you never know if it'll make $250,000. But if you get hired, you can be quite sure that you will never make more than $250,000. And so that's why I started it. And so this company, Photopy, I don't know how big it is, but depending on how many users it has, I could see this getting sold for nine figures, over a hundred million dollars. So um, he did an AMA on Reddit, and they said, uh, "Hey, have you hired your first employee yet?" This was a year ago, and uh, he says, "Oh, after I did my first AMA on Reddit, um, lots of great people got in touch. I did end up hiring one guy from Prague who uh, who went to my university, but it'll take some time for him to get familiar with the code. He hasn't done it. He hasn't, like hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> it's pretty crazy how this guy uh, operates. So why do you think this is the most challenging?" I uh, just think technically recreating Photoshop feature for feature is absolutely insane. Like, I think that's just an insane endeavor. Um, and then making it work in the browser, like making it performant in a browser is not easy either. So like for one person to do this, I think it's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. I, uh, the, the cool thing about these, like what I think the, the downside of these one person companies is that everything relies on you. And that you don't have like anyone else to ask for help, and you can't hire anyone. You can't have anyone better than you doing something because you're the only person. And so, in order to do this, I think a lot of these people 
they have a they have a handful of traits that we'll talk about in the end. But I don't understand how he could grind that hard for that long with all this pressure on him. By the way, this guy says he put seven thousand hours into it before he made any money from it. That's insane. So <laughs> I think that 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 just takes so much will. Do you remember Viral Nova? It was a guy yeah. named Scott DeLong. So Viral Nova was basically an upworthy clone. It was a. It says like they're like here's a list of ten reasons why you don't want to go swimming after eating you're not going to believe number seven and so this guy would talk about like how it was just him writing 10 articles a day and he was like i'm the pressure of all this traffic and all the success it's killing me i feel so worn out all the time and i don't understand how some people can sustain that for a really long time like this photo p guy yeah this is like you know when you go to someone's house and they're like oh do you want to see my model train set i'm building you're like what uh yeah sure why not i'm here and they take it down to the basement and then it's just like they've recreated like the city of vienna uh, through their like and they're just tinkering on this like one thing they're like uh how many hours what, how long have you been doing this and they're like oh i just come here every night i love it and this is what i do it makes me feel so good and you're like holy shit this is like <laughs> the most intense hobby that's how that's how I i'm feel not that the guy. i'm not that type of person are you you're uh, definitely dude, not no. i think right <laughs> come on <laughs> i'm not uh yeah i envy those people that that's an amazing uh, willpower all right let's do another one let's do on the other end easiest to recreate so which of these one person one or two person businesses do you think are easiest to recreate that um is the opposite of the highest degree of difficulty go ahead um, so mine would be anything that sells information or a service. So I put just any course creator, but you and I know a bunch of these people of which you and I are both of those people. Uh, <laughs> you know, we make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year from like a, a course or two. And I think they're fairly easy to recreate. Another one is, uh, there's this company called design joy. Do you, what, you know what they do? Yeah, I believe that it's a design uh, subscription, basically it's him. He's a design yeah, but. The way that he positions it, it seems really hard to imagine that that's the truth. But basically, it's just this designer that you pay thousands of dollars a month for, and you ask him to make small changes to different design-related stuff. And he claims that it's just him, but I, I believe he claims that. Yeah, but he says that it's just him, like, and he does $100,000 a month, so he does $1.2 million a year or so, r- r- around that range. And it's basically, you buy a subscription plan. So you pay, and you buy like the five, it's like four or 5000 a month. Um, and then you you basically get one request at a time, um, and that's it. <laughs> you get to just say, "I'd like this design thing done," and then he turns around and some. I don't know what his SLA is of how long he takes to uh, to do this, but it's like it's cheaper than hiring a full time designer, probably unless like in, in the U.S. Um, but yeah, that's the. Uh, I that's think that's the easiest to recreate, but also the worst to run, which we'll talk about later. But that's probably the easiest one. Is like a bunch. Of, do you know any other course people that do like? Like yeah. I know Sam Ovens does ten million in revenue, five million in profit, and for a while it was just him. I met these um, guys. Uh, I met a guy recently who does like a product management course, and I was like, oh my god, who's taking a product management course? He, he goes, no, no, no. It's how to ace your job interview as a product manager, like how to get a job as a PM at one of these tech companies. And I think he was doing what was he doing? About like two million a year or something like that. I think they were doing like two what. 2.5. Yeah, 2.5 million a year uh roughly in in revenue. I think with like 80%ish margins. And what they would do is they would basically say they would give away free content that was like how to, you know, how to get a job as a PM, how to interview as a PM, how to uh prep for this interview, what what it was like talking to a Facebook PM, blah blah blah. They give away free content to get you kind of on the email list and get you to the website. And then they're like, "Hey, do you want to like get a job as a PM which will pay you, let's call it $120,000 a year. If you want that job, um, buy this course and uh, join this cohort of course or whatever. And they basically sell this course for a couple thousand dollars. That's going to help you get this job that's going to pay you over $100,000. And that's just like a very simple value proposition for somebody who wants to uh, wants to do that with their career. And it was just him? It was him and three, it was, it was three of them, three, p- three PMs that kind of like got together and made this thing. Another example of an easy one to start, I think I told you about this, it's called CyberLead. So you go to getcyberleads.com. So it's C-Y-B-E-R leads. So getcyberleads.com. It's this guy named Alex West. And basically, it's a newsletter where 
I, I think it costs four to a thousand dollars a month. So four hundred to a thousand dollars a month, uh, depending on what you get, what you do. But basically, he goes and he handpicks different companies that have recently raised money, and based off a bunch of attributes he thinks are about to hire an agency, and then he gets all these agency owners to sign up to his service, and he emails this list out once a month, along with like the contact information, the hiring decision, or the hiring. Uh, uh, like whoever's managing ad spend, whatever, and you can just contact him he's, on. He's got your face and quote as a testimonial. Do you use this? No, I don't <laughs> use this. But I talked, I, I talked about it on the pod. Uh, I talked about it on the pod like two years ago. I've never used it. Uh, I've never. I, You've I'm never not, used it. I'm not. But he sure used you. <laughs> he is using me. I don't know. Is there anything? Can I? Can you say anything about these people who do this? I talked about it on the pod. I said it's so freak, freaking simple. The value is so clear. I guess I said that on the podcast, <laughs> and he uses that as a quote. Yeah. I, is there anything I could do to stop yeah, you? Can tell from doing him, that? Hey, take that down. You can always say that. Um, oh, sorry. Let me wrap up my thing. Selling information. So anything that you sell information, that's the easiest thing to start. Yeah, I think uh, so. I went the same route, but I'm gonna give more detail because I think when you tell somebody selling information is the easiest way, they're like, "Cool, what? So what do I do?" So, Bitch, I gave three uh, examples. Yeah, but I think you have to break it down a little further. So, um, you know this guy, Lenny, Lenny, Russian last name? <laughs> I, don't know exactly. I like Lenny. So, Rogowski or? Rogowski, uh, something, something along those lines. I like Lenny. So Lenny, I think, used to work at Airbnb or something. He was like um, a growth slash like product guy. And so he's got Lenny's newsletter. He's got Lenny's community. He's got Lenny's job board. And basically he was like, I'm going to become, he's like, I'm going to put out tons of free thought leader content on a specific super niche topic that only certain people are going to care about, but they're going to care a lot. And that's, that's kind of the key with this stuff is how do you put out free content to establish yourself as an authority in a niche so that you can then monetize that through either consulting services, job board, paid community, or, um, or, paid content, paid newsletter, right? That's, that's the formula. And you can look at the, um, the design joy guy. He does exactly this. He puts out free content, examples of design work, and then says, you can hire me for design work. Um, Lenny does the same thing. He puts out free content. He's got really good stuff. Like, you know, how did these 10 huge marketplaces, how did they get their first thousand users? And he goes deep and he's like, I'm going to interview them. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to get the real answer on this specific zero to one question. That's going to be highly relevant to other people going through that same challenge. I think he has a podcast too. He's got a podcast. Like at one point, his job board was doing a couple hundred thousand. I'm sure the newsletter does a couple hundred thousand in sponsorships. I are think, you talking about monthly or annually? Annually. Um, uh, at least. I bet you it's least, more. These are minimum. I bet you it's yeah. way more. Like I, I know at the beginning, his job board was crushing. I don't know what they're doing now. But like I would bet his entire roll-up of job board, um, content sponsorships, so podcast plus newsletter. And then uh, he's got a paid thing, right, Ben? He's got like a paid... Paid community. What's it? What do you think Lenny's total thing is? Two million, three million. Yeah, for sure. Two, about two to three million uh, a year, and he did that. I would say in a period of like two and a half, three years. It seems like, like I think he. I think he has a, a fun too. He kind of put his foot down on the content side. I like he kind of appeared on the scene. I would say like two, two ish years ago. Um, obviously, you had to know your stuff, right? So he's like you know spent time learning, you know a decade being awesome inside these companies in order to do so. So I don't mean to make it sound overly simplistic, but there are people who did it without that too. So another example is uh, Harry Dry, one of my favorite content creators in the whole world, a guy I tried to recruit like a hundred times to do something with me because I feel like me too. we could do something great. Um, me too. And he, he, keeps, he keeps bullshitting and, and not saying yes, but he's going to say yes eventually. So he's got marketing examples. He does a great job with this blog called Marketing Examples. Now, I don't know how much Marketing Examples makes. I would guess quarter million to half a million as just him making content well, there. I think he's young. He's I very he young. 20. He didn't do the put in 10 to 15 years, become an industry, like, like do the job, cut your teeth, then go make content. He's like, no, I'm pretty sure I could just look at what's out there and like give my opinion on it and it'll work. I'll study this shit. And that's how I feel like you know a lot of people also can do it. You can be the curious novice approaching these uh, topics and become an expert just by studying them intensely. And so uh, I think Harry Dry would also be one of the easiest to recreate. Not because he's not talented. He's super talented, but I think that's kind of something anyone can do. Anybody could just say, yo, I'm going to study what makes TikToks go viral. 
and I'm going to put out content about viral TikToks. I'm going to become the expert of breaking down content, uh, TikToks going viral. And then pe- brands are going to know me as the guy that they should talk to about TikTok consulting, right? Like, uh, or like advertising on TikTok. And like, you could just build your niche audience and your niche authority in that space. A lot of people are trying to do this with AI right now. And the thing about Lenny and Harry was people were doing... So first of all, like a newsletters, community podcast, that's existed since forever. Uh, so it's not a unique business model. And also, people have been talking about that type of stuff for a long time. But what's interesting is that they were both early-ish, where there was only maybe... I don't know how many, but they felt like they were early-ish talking about it to this customer, to this community on this platform. So both of those guys, I think, got popular on Twitter right before the pandemic started. I think I remember seeing Harry in 2018, 2019, which I wasn't even really using Twitter as a power user back then. But they all seem a little bit early. So I think timing matters for a lot of these things. Uh, speaking of which, that Facebook threads thing, no idea if that's going to be a thing or not. But that's an example of like, hey, there's this new thing right now. If you want you to, to you lose, pounce on you better be there. Yeah, just go get, go be around there. See what's going on. Yeah, that's one of those things people did with Clubhouse. I don't know if that worked out or not. But uh, there's the way this- I, I say it is like, you uh, most, most entrepreneurs, you were actually surfing waves. You don't get to create the wave, but you do have to paddle out. You got to be on your board out there in the water. You got to paddle out. And, you know, which is a, takes effort, and then you gotta wait. And sometimes it's a dud. Sometimes it's just a small wave. You're gonna have to paddle back out again. Well, when you catch a good one, you know that's when you get. And we'll see how good you are at surfing. You might wipe out the first couple times you try it, but like that's your job as an entrepreneur is to paddle out, be out there, and start trying to surf these waves and, and get a sense for where are the big waves and um, and how do I not wipe out when I do when I do find one. So this episode, you're giving a really in depth surf analogy. Last episode, you gave a slow uh, a fat uh, a, f- a pitching a baseball. What did you say? A fat, a slow, I love a small fat swing. <laughs> fat pitches. <laughs> it was fat pitches. I got have you ever played baseball? Addiction. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever played baseball or surf in your life, bro? I was starting right fielder for my high school team. Which anybody who knows baseball knows that means you're the biggest scrub on the team because that's who that's who they put in right field is the guy who's you know you know, the ball never comes to right field. And, yeah, but uh, did you play baseball in China? Like they were just learning. <laughs> I might have been in China. I might have been in China. You, play, you went to high school and you went to high school in China. Yeah, I mean, or or Australia. Like it was hey, the scrubs. It was like we play the ball as it lies. There, I got a golf analogy for you too. Uh, I was in China. Well, that's where I'm going to be. Our software is the worst. Have you heard of HubSpot? See, most CRMs are a cobbled together mess, but HubSpot is easy to adopt and actually looks gorgeous. I think I love our new CRM. Our software is the best. HubSpot, grow better. Let's go to the next one. Most fun one-person business. So the one that seems like the most fun to, to work on, I'll go first, Joe Rogan. So I'm pretty sure Joe Rogan's media enterprise is bigger than all the late night talk shows combined. So forget the Tonight Show, Letterman, and any of these guys, whoever the new guy, Conan, whoever these guys are. Dude, Letterman's been retired for 10 years, man. Jimmy Fallon, I don't know. Uh, bro, who's, who's watching this stuff? His audience is bigger. He makes uh, hundreds of millions in, uh, he's made hundreds of millions doing it. And I'm pretty sure it's just him and Young Jamie. I've heard uh, from uh, a few of my friends who have been on it how it works. So basically, they told me that it's Jamie who produces it, and it's Joe. And then they have one other guy named Matt, I think. And I forget his name exactly. I think it was Matt. And basically, Matt sends Joe a list of like 30 people. They're like, hey, I can get these 30 people, these 30, let me know who you want. And sometimes he just ignores it. Every once in a while, he'll say, that person and that person. And that's all he <laughs> says. And I've heard that it's just those three people. That's amazing. So. I think most people just think, oh, Joe Rogan, he's just a podcaster. Yeah, he is a podcaster, but that thing is a juggernaut. It is a media juggernaut. So the, you know, Spotify obviously paid him, you know, hundreds of millions to to be there uh, for a couple of years. But even before that, you know, just off the sponsorships, off of uh, off of the Alpha Brain, you know, um, product that they built off of it, Joe Rogan, I think, has the most fun probably of anyone on the planet. <laughs> is my sense. He took all of his hobbies. He's like, oh, I like UFC. He gets to be the UFC commentator uh, doing exactly what he would want. He gets to go sit ringside, commentate for these fights and analyze the fights. But he only does it the, for the ones in Vegas that are an hour flight away from him. He doesn't do any of the, the, the ones that require a bunch of travel. Um, and so all the he does all the best ones. He does none of the worst ones. 
you know, he was like, I want to do stand up comedy. So he does stand up comedy, sells out, you know, uh, theaters all around the country and, um, you know, gets to make people laugh for a living. Does this podcast where he's like, I'm going to have conversations with the people I want. And people are like, oh, Joe, three hours is too long. He's like, that's the type of conversation I want to have. So I'm going to do it my way. And it worked. And so, like, I just think he just dictated how he wants to live life on his terms. I think he has the most fun. I think his business is absolutely a mighty business in that it's just, let's say, one, two to three people that uh, is building a, a thing that does, you know, over $100 million in, in revenue, which is like, if you just valued something like that, you know, um, traditionally, which is not, it's not apples to apples, but like, if you have a thing that can do a hundred million a year in revenue for multiple years, for multiple years, you typically that's a billion dollar property. And, um, you know, obviously it's weird. You can't really sell the you know, Joe Rogan experience because y- you need him. It's tightly branded with him, but let's say at least he's built something worth a hundred million dollars. I think we can agree on that because it's generated a hundred million of profit for him. And so he's built, you know, with a very small team, a multi hundred million dollar business at the minimum. And he has this new thing called the comedy mothership. It's like a mile from my house in Austin. And there's always a line out the door to get into right. that place. Yeah, like builds his dri- own comedy dri- club. Why not? Why not? If you drive by it at six o'clock, there's every single night there's been a line out the door to go there. And it looks awesome. Right. Who you got? Most fun. All right. So scroll up to the very top of this doc. I put a link in there. It sounds like I'm trying to like promote Hampton. I'm not. It's just that when I had to prepare for this episode, I just went through our database and like picked out people. And we had just written a blog post about this guy. His name's Joseph Mambre. And he started this company called Jim Streak. And this guy is super fascinating because he has all the attributes of like what a lot of these like tinkers have. But basically, he's from Zimbabwe, moved to England when he was like 12 or 13. That was the first time that he experienced the internet. He taught himself how to code. He taught himself design. And then he launched this thing called Jim Streak. At first, it was just an app for tracking your workouts. And then he, what he did was he went and got his buddy to wear one of these like suits. And that way he could do 3D visualizations of all the exercises and what they need to look like. So he has hundreds of them. And so his app, it's free to use. And they have some like premium thing. And basically, you track your workouts. He uses AI to suggest which weights you should do for the next workout. And if you don't know what the exercise does, and they'll, they'll suggest workouts and exercises to do. He has hundreds of these 3D models of like what a proper bicep curl or what this other type of exercise looks like. In year one, he did $300,000. That was in year 2021. In year two, he did $2.5 million. And his goal, he says, is by in the next two years, I want to get to $15 to $20 million a year in revenue. And he's the only employee. I don't believe he has any contractors. I think he, he told me that he... Uh, got most of his uh, users from Facebook and TikTok ads. And he hired a consultant in an agency to help him learn how to do that. And right now, he said, I'm taking the summer off. So our growth this year might still only be 2.5 or 3 million a year in revenue. But I because I don't feel like buying ads or staying on top of that. So I'm taking the summer off because we just had a kid. But super fascinating to see a guy who basically came from Zimbabwe, didn't use the internet until he was 12, 13, and taught himself how to do all this. He's like one of those really cool tinkers. And on that blog post, you can see pictures of him like arriving from Africa and like learning how to work the computer. It's super fascinating. You'll see pictures of him with his like iPhone and a laptop at the gym, filming people doing like the curls so he can use his AI or whatever to like get the 3D imaging. Really fascinating company. I think. Jim Streak is awesome. If this could get to 15 or 20 million a year in revenue, like he thinks, that would be a monster business for one person. Yeah, that's an amazing story. Wow. Love that. Uh, good for him. That's that's really, really cool. Um, next category. Business we most want to own. <laughs> so this is, um, I think this is specifically a good question because for us, a business we'd want to own would be the lowest maintenance business because neither of us want to really run an extra business right now. So it's like, which business would you want to own because it is very much, uh, you know, autopilot? So it's not design joy. It's not people are paying you and you're providing a subscription. It's not one of those content or course businesses where you constantly have to create new content in order to stay relevant and get more customers. Um, I think we both have the same one. Let's just do the same one that we we both are really interested in. You, you explain it. Go for it. No, you go first. All right. Milled.com. So most people don't know milled.com. It's M-I-L-L-E-D. Dot com, and it's a really, really simple website. It's just a compilation of email marketing that different companies do. So if you want to see like, what are my competitors sending for their 4th of July sale? 
You just go to mill.com, you search the brand, and you'll see, okay, here's what Ridge Wallet sent uh, for their 4th of July uh, email. It's the top one on the on the site right, site right now. So it says, you know, you just click and it shows you the exact email that they sent. So you can see the design, you can see the offer, you can see the copy, and you could use that to get inspiration for what you should be doing for your email marketing. And this guy built this site, uh, I don't know how long ago now, but um, he's posted on Hacker News a little bit about it. And it's one person. It's a side project. He does a million dollars a year on it. And he said, I was uh, I was doing email marketing for a brand. I noticed two things. One, it took us several days to create each email blast. Um, and two, I had to subscribe to like dozens of other co- competitor emails just to do research for, for them. So my hypothesis was I could create a site that would just sign up for all the brands, uh, you know, email newsletters and, um, and then make it easier for anybody who's trying to do email marketing, right? That's the, uh, that's, that's the core, core pitch for it. And he's just been running it as a side project. Doesn't take much maintenance. Doesn't, you know, he could just do nothing on it for a little while. And, and it makes money through ads. Yeah. So, so they use ads on the left side here. You can see like I have it open and he's basically got like an, a, like a link to the brand itself. And then he's got like a cybersecurity, uh, like ad here popped up on b- below it. He's got like a skincare ad. Yeah. It's just display ads. So, but here's another way how he makes money. So basically, you are, you're a marketer. You go to Mild and you want to see like uh, it looks like some shoe brand. They run they ran this campaign, and you want to check out the email and you read it and get inspired, or whatever. You click that ad, and it takes you to the shoe company, and it's using an affiliate link if you buy some of the shoes. Right. This is a horrible way to monetize. <laughs> this is a, a really a, under a amazing product. <laughs> under mono under monetized website for sure. But good for him for getting the traffic in the first place. But that's a horrible way to monetize. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, but I think the guy doesn't care. He's just like, this is easy, that's cool. uh, low maintenance, which is why I put it in my one I'd want to own because it's low maintenance and I think it still has a lot of upside uh, left. I'll do one for one I want to own. So I said anything that is like marketplacey, uh, sort of like a marketplace. Because sometimes if you do it right, those don't they don't run themselves entirely, but the the community kind of handles the business. Uh, built with so built with was started in 2015 or 16 probably. Built with is like the most niche shit ever, but there's it's a really big niche. So you go to built with in order to see which plugins a website is using if they are using WordPress. And the reason why that's important is you go to a website that you like and you go, oh, I love this feature they have. Let's go and By see way, what they're using. Not just WordPress, Shopify also. That's new. It started with just WordPress, I think. Um, and so you're like, just tell me like the plugins and tell me the the everything that they're using. Shopify and built with uh, Shopify and WordPress. It has something like tens of millions of people going there a month, and does at the time when I first found them, I think in 2020, I think they were doing 14, 15 million in revenue with just one person. So I think that would be a really cool company to own because I think it's super valuable. Once you get all that traffic and those people coming back to you all the time, I think it's a really valuable site. Do you know anything about Built With? Yeah. Uh, just what you told what you said there. I've been using it for a long time. Basically, if you see a website, you want to know what they use for whatever they use, just go to Built With. It's pretty great. Uh, it's kind of like a data... It's almost like a data index, right? It's like more like a database than it is a, a marketplace in a way. Uh, but I agree. It's kind of amazing. Um, all right, let's keep going. We got a couple categories left. We have a rookie of the year, so a new one, a new a new one that we found. I think you might have already covered yours uh, in here, but dude, I it's boring. One. I didn't want to say the same thing twice, but this guy Joe Mambre, this Joseph Mambre, like I love his story. I think that this guy's going to be a big deal, and I and I take a lot of pride in trying to find people before they're like really popular. I, I think he's read the blog post that I that I have linked up there from the Hampton site. It, it's really good. I think this guy's going to be a winner. So that's my rookie of the year. What's only finders? Only Finders is mine. So this is one that I don't know how old it is, maybe a couple of years old now. Um, so Only Finders is a search engine for OnlyFans. So if you want to find a type of model on OnlyFans, so you you know you're into you know blonde Asians or like you know whatever good looking midgets, whatever whatever you're into, <laughs> you can search on Only Finders and it'll give you a list of top ranked profiles for that thing. So as you know, I've been down the OnlyFans rabbit hole where I'm like, I think there's a lot of potential in the OnlyFans uh, world of like businesses. And this was one of them that I found. And um, OnlyFinders run by one guy. He's awesome. He listens to the pod. He um, and he crushes it. So he crushes the SEO game for for OnlyFans. If you search for a bunch of different popular searches. Um, and in fact, actually, what what it, what he did was smart, which is he didn't want to just rank for like 
the general uh, searches, like best OnlyFans or something like that. Like he wants the high intent ones. So he wants the person who's searching for like whatever. I, I don't know what people search for, but like redhead. Yeah, redhead. So if you, nice if, if you go to something. his site, <laughs> if you go to his site, you could you click the button on the right hand and it says like what the top searches are. So it's like Indian. Uh, girls uh, with boyfriends I don't even to, whatever <laughs> yeah I don't even want to read half of this stuff the stuff that people but, are yeah. into so it's what he categories what he did was <laughs> he ranks really high for the categories that people are that's like clearly people's thing and it's like I don't know what your thing is but I got if, if you got a thing I got it for you and because of that those are really really high intent searches and then what he does on the other side is he goes to OnlyFans models and agencies and he says hey if you want more traffic I have tons of people searching for your exact thing pay me per click for every person I send to you. So he's basically recreated Google. It's a search engine where you get paid per click to send an, uh, somebody with intent to your, to your, to your site. And um, he could do it. <laughs> he does a really, really good job of it. And OnlyFans does not have a discover section on purpose. They decided they don't want to be in the discovery business. They want to only be in the, uh, like the kind of the underlying tools underneath these creator profiles. And so, this is insane. Um, and it's just been surfing the growth of OnlyFans, which has grown like exponentially. Like OnlyFans a few years ago was very small, uh, you know, five, you know, whatever, four or five years ago was very small. And then it got bigger and bigger. It's like sort of like, I mean, the curve looks, looks unreal. Like OnlyFans is bigger than Twitch. It's bigger than like some of these massive websites uh, now. And it generates a lot of money. Like they pay out billions to creators uh, on the platform. And so if you can be part of that ecosystem, it's valuable. That's insane. I have, met, I have now met multiple people on OnlyFans that you've never heard of. Girls that are doing between one and two million a month on their profile. No way. It's two all million a month. Because their body is the cogs. So there's no, <laughs> it's, it's all profit, basically. They have like, you know, usually they have like, a, they'll, they'll have like some of them, uh, as you get bigger, you have like an agency that manages it. So what are they doing with this money? They're just... They just have huge income, and how long do you think can they do it for? Five years, three years? Yeah. And it's funny they kind oh of some of them kind of exit, they burn out, and they'll just sell their like name, likeness, and photo library, and be like, "You run it, and just give me a rev share, give me fifty percent." It's like Bruce Springsteen. That's what he did. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> the boss. Uh, this is insane. I I don't know much. I I don't know much about this shit. Uh, this is absolutely insane. The engagement on these things are wild. If you have an OnlyFans business, reach out to me. Sean at SeanPuri.com. I want to invest in OnlyFans businesses that are just cash flowing. Are they cool? Like when you met these? They're cool. The problem is they're very hard to sell and they're very easy to be killed. And so they need kind of like strategy on like how... No, how I mean the girls. Oh, I don't know. I don't know them. You said you hung out with a, a couple of them. I hang out with them. I just talk to them. Yeah, they're they're nice people. I don't know. That's insane. How did you get in touch with them? It's the internet, bro. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? You know, I, I've, how many times on here have I talked about OnlyFans? And then, then people basically are like, oh, you're into that. So then they email you. And well, like, they, they probably have a million Indian guys like DMing them. Uh, I mean, that's insane. <laughs> this is insane. Well, I, don't go th- um, I don't go through, you know, if, when you see a big line at the front door, you don't, t- you, don't, you don't go wait in that line. You have to go find a side door. And the side door is generally you know some some dude who listens to our podcast that runs their business or is their manager and that's kind of like the way it all right let's that if we do all right the last category is worst of the best i have a different one but i would have to say only fans would be up there but <laughs> what if, I, I have another so one worst this one of the is best um, is these are all cool businesses but which which ones are least favorite so uh yours is going to be only fans no, uh, I mean, it would be, but uh, I already had something else. Kevin Van Trump. So Kevin Van Trump, I met this guy. Sean likes him a lot now. Uh, I met him in 2018. I was at a conference and Kevin Van Trump is like six feet tall and he's like really big. He's like a very, very large, overweight guy. And he walks up to me and he's got this super thick accent. He goes, hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? Like, he just starts talking to me. And I'm like, well, this guy is so confident. And he got, started talking about all my newsletters and the hustle and all this stuff. And he's got this thick accent. And he's wearing a Ramones t-shirt. And he's got like Converse on. He just looks like a like a like a like a Walmart guy. And then like he <laughs> dropped he drops like one or two lines where for some reason we talked about art. And he was like, Oh yeah, that Picasso, I got one of them some bitches. Like he said something like that. I was like, What? So I let it slide. And then I go, how many subscribers are on your, your newsletter? And he goes like, oh, 60,000. And he goes, hey, how much do you guys charge for yours? And I go, oh, it's free. We make money on ads. 
you charge? It goes, yeah, we charge like $300 a month. I forget exactly what it was. And I like do the math in my head. And I'm like, wait, that's $20 million a year. He goes, yeah, it's something like that. I don't even know. <laughs> and I started hanging out with him. And he, and he basically, this guy's name is Kevin Van Trump. He's got this newsletter where he talks about agriculture and like how it impacts commodity prices. And it, he's brilliant. And I get to know him a little bit more. And you're like, oh, no, you just have a Southern accent. He like was a Wall Street like trader. He, the guy's brilliant. He's amazing. And he lives in Kansas City. And I've done a Zoom call with him. And you see like he's got like these custom built motorcycles in the back of his like house. And he's got like all these Picassos and shit. The guy's killing it. But that same day when I hung out with him, I was like, hey, do you want to go get dinner? He's like, yeah, I can go get, get dinner. We, we hang out at 8.30. He goes, hey, man, I got to run. I got to go write tomorrow's newsletter. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what? He goes, I do it every day. I've done it every day for 10 years. I go, what do you mean every day? He goes, six days a week, I send a newsletter. And it's 2,000 plus words. It's really long. He does it every day. And he was making all of this money. I don't think I would trade lights with him, though, just to have all that money. I had the same answer. I think he's amazing. You put me on to him. I met him and his son. Such awesome people. So, like they're awesome. Super they're fun. So awesome. Just fun to be around. Smart. Uh, really nice. Just kind people. Don't like you know no no pretense about them. Um, and same thing. He was hosting FarmCon. I went because you had told me about him and introduced me to him. And when when I go there, he's we're he has a out. conference called FarmCon. Yeah, he's got FarmCon, which is like the biggest farming mm-hmm. conference get together. So I go to Kansas, and I and was it awesome? Yeah, it was amazing. And I'm there, and we're talking. It's like eleven at night. It's like the the whole event's done. Everyone's at the bar. Every single person is drinking a beer. Every single person is drinking a beer. And uh, he's like, I gotta get up. Gotta get up to the bedroom. Gotta uh, I gotta go back to my room real quick. Write the write tomorrow's edition. And I was like, Wait, you write it yourself still? And he's like, yeah, I write it. I've, I've written it myself by hand every night. And he started this thing more than 10 years ago. Like, I think he'd said like almost like 20 years, basically. And he's been writing this thing, 18 years or something insane. Every day almost. Yeah. And it's long too. It's not like just some cookie cutter, like Mm-mm. here's three links that are interesting. It's like, My you know, Jerome Powell came down, said this, but and he said, said this, said that, you know, here's how this is going to affect corn futures. And here's what I'm, I'm betting over here. And, Blah, blah, blah. And then there's a bunch of memes. <laughs> it's amazing. It's basically his market analysis for like crop, you know, crop and commodities. And then it's a bunch of memes underneath it. And he's like, nope, never do ads. Um, he's like, I just wanted to build as much trust as I can in this community. And uh, so I never advertise. I, I charge for it. And uh, that's why we have farm cons. Why everybody shows up is because, you know, they, they, I built a lot of trust over the, over the years. And I learned more about business from that guy in like one hour than I did in my entire like four year education at Duke. Like he said to me, he said a bunch of things that I, that I loved. I put this in my, my, my newsletter. I did a feature on him that I wrote a bunch of the lessons, but one of them that he said was, he goes, yeah, content's cool, but he's like being, he goes, being an investor is the best job in the world. You kidding me? Uh, he's like, and he, he just said it so matter of factly. He's like, there is no better job in the world than being an investor. It is, it is the best. And you sort of think about that. You're like, all right, well, that sounds, you know, whatever, I guess kind of obvious. And it's like, okay, if that's true, then how do you get into that job? Like if, if that is true for you, um, how do you architect your life to get there? Cause he was basically just like, look, this newsletter is great. Yeah. It crushes, makes a lot of money, but I wish I was just an investor. Uh, it would have been a better, better, better choice, blah, blah. And he talks about investing cause he, I think he was on Wall Street before he started doing what he was doing. Yeah. And he goes, um, he goes, you know, one thing I only, he goes, I was early into Bitcoin. I was early into Facebook. I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. He's like, I wasn't as early as I could have been. He's like, but there's always, uh, he's like, I got into Bitcoin like in 20, he's like, we started hearing about it at FarmCon like in 2013, 2014. I didn't buy it until 2015, 2016. I should have been in it right when I first heard it. He's like, same thing with Facebook. He goes, one, one lesson I learned in investing, he goes, um, he goes, two, two lessons for you in investing. Number one, the best trades are going to be one where, ones where you buy them, and you put them in the drawer, you never think about them again. He's like, that, he's like, that was the best thing I did about Bitcoin. I bought Bitcoin, I put it in the drawer, never thought about it again. Heard all the news, didn't care. It's in the drawer. And I was like, damn, in the drawer. That's a cool concept of like, what investments can you just have the conviction in you put in the drawer? You say, I'm not going to react to the daily news cycle about this investment. I'm going to let the 10 years play out on this investment because it was a, let's see what happens on the long-term type of bet. Um, second thing he said was, he goes, uh, you always get a second chance to get on the train with the best investments. There's always a second chance on the train. He's like with Bitcoin, you know, you think you missed it and then the price will come down. That's your chance to get back on the train. 
And most people by that time, you know, they spend the whole way up wishing they had got on the train. Train comes back around and they get scared. They don't get back on. Yeah. You know, same thing happened with Facebook. Facebook, you know, we had our chances uh, when it was private. Then it goes public. It goes up, up, up. Crash back down to nineteen dollars. I got back on the train. You know, that that train came around. I got right back on. And he's like, you know, that will happen for the best investments. And I sort of look for this now of like, uh, how do you override the psychology that most people have, which is when it's going up, you wish you had gotten in earlier. Then when it crashes down, you're too afraid to buy in because you feel like, oh shit, did it, is it over? Did it pop? Is it, did I miss it? Um, was I wrong? And it's like, well, then you lose, lose. You, <laughs> you, know, you know, you want to buy on the way up and you don't want to buy on the way down. That's, that's a recipe for being poor, right? Like, you know, <laughs> buy high, don't buy low, right? That's not going to work. And so uh, those two little lessons were, were ones that stuck out for me. But this guy's business is amazing. He's an amazing guy. And the reason he's amazing, among other things, is he breaks all the stereotypes. He, you, you'll think that he's just this like hickey guy, just like people used to think about me. Uh, and like I grew up around people just like him. Turns out he's like brilliant. He'll, he'll like, you're, you're like, you're going to talk to me about Facebook? And he knows way more about it than you do. He'll probably knows all about Bitcoin. I mean, the guy's brilliant. And uh, I love hanging out with him and his friends because you it teaches you like i'm a fucking idiot for judging people a certain way these guys are all badass Dude, and they're fun as shit i did a call the other day with another guy so uh another guy from FarmCon, same same sort of guy he's this uh white guy maybe i don't know in his 50s ish something like that was he super rich because so many of those guys super are super rich and I, I think this guy I, I don't know how rich this guy like is private jet rich i don't know how rich this guy is but the guy who introduced me to him is just like, yeah, this guy's worth, you know, 300 to 500 million dollars personally. And I was like, wow, uh, OK, that's crazy. Because I was like, has, I was like, do his deals like he's always talking about these deals. Like, does he actually make money on these? Like, has he had a track record of success? He's like, yeah, he has. Um, <laughs> so this guy, this guy's got phrases for days. So I, I have this doc that I keep on my phone. I call phrases. It's, anytime somebody says something that's just like funny or worded well, it just sticks out to me. It's a punchy phrase. I write it down. At FarmCon, I filled out my phrases thing, like because there were so many. So this one guy, um, I, I don't want to say his name to put him on blast, but he uh, he was at a dinner with uh, so it's Kevin Van Trump, and then this guy was at the dinner, and it was like a private dinner at the at FarmCon. And um, he stands up and he goes, and it was everyone, the, "Everyone on the table is doing introductions." And so there, I'm like, "Oh, how I am, Sean, and yeah, I work in tech, and uh, just fucking kill me. I guess I'm boring. Like you know, like that's basically like how I felt during the introduction." This guy stands up, he goes. Yeah, my name's so and so. He goes, um, you know, uh, he goes <laughs> exactly what he said. He goes, he goes, uh, I don't know who won the World Series. He starts, I don't know who won the World Series. <laughs> I can't tell you how to get a six pack abs. Hell, I don't even know where the remote is in my house. But I know one thing. <laughs> I know how to structure deals. And today I'm gonna tell you guys about a deal that I'm doing. And he like gave this intro and I was like, what an incredible I was like, what an incredible way to introduce yourself. I don't know where the remote is, but I know one thing. I know deals. And I was like, that is incredible. Then he's uh he's talking about how old he is. He goes, You cut me in half, there's gonna be a lot of rings. That's <laughs> the like, best. Nice. And then he goes, and then I, I did a call with him the other day. And uh, I get on the Zoom call and I had just finished my workout and my trainer was like insisting because I was like, dude, I got to run. I got to be on this call. He's like, all right, just take your call, but let's do your like kind of like we try to do like this, like myofascial, like kind of like you're rolling like a like a foam roller type of thing. Like you're, you're kind of like foam rolling out at the end. So we were doing it and he's like, just do it while you you're on the call. Foam rolled with this guy on a call. So I get on the call. I turn on the video and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to show him what's going on. So I'm, I'm like, sorry if uh, sorry, this looks weird. I'm doing like some stretching. And he goes, <laughs> so he's a big dude. And he goes, okay, cool. If uh, if it looks like I'm stretching, call nine one one because I'm having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> dude, uh, why would you like, take a call like that? Incredible wit, like to have that line uh, immediately ready when I say, if, uh, you know, that I'm stretching. If it, sorry, if it looks weird, I'm stretching. I was like, wow, that was literally so fucking funny to me. I was blown away. I was like, I don't even care what else happens on this call. That that was so impressive, so good. What state did he live in? Uh, he's in Tennessee, I think. What the hell is a deal struck? I don't even know what that means. Like he, like he does basically like, private equity, so he buys companies. Um, but he's like, I just know how to find a great deal, how to put the financing together, and how to structure it so that like 
I get the maximum value out of these deals. It's kind of like what he does. Um, and like, you know, you're, I'm like, so I was like, I was like, you know, what, um, uh, I was like, have you done any deals that like that I would have heard of? And he's like, you know, Disneyland. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, a lot of windows in Disneyland. We do all the windows in Disneyland. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh my God. Like, okay. They bought a window company, got them a Disney contract. <laughs> we do all the windows at Disney. <laughs> I was like, okay, do what with the windows? Like clean them? We got to have this them? guy on the pod. Oh, this guy's incredible. What's yours for uh, World's uh, Worst of the Best? Um, I had both Design Joy and the Kevin Van Trump just because of the time thing. So I love that Kevin Van Trump has built like this, this amazing power niche in the farming industry. But I, uh, I would not want to be the guy who has to write the newsletter every night because the pressure is it's got to go out tomorrow morning. I felt that during Milk Road for a month and I was like, nope, not doing it this way. Yeah. I, although I think if I was him, I would just find a way to hire somebody to do that. Like, I can't believe he hasn't done that yet. Um, Does Ben Thompson still do strate- I haven't read this uh, in yeah, a so while. Ben Thompson is, it- is, is my version of that. So he does Stratechery and every day he writes a newsletter about basically the same four things and I don't even know how he does that. Like he talks about Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and like what's going, like the kind of the business and strategy of what they're doing. Dude, they're so long. These are so long. And he does this daily long form. His audience is like, has the highest bar. His audience is like the smartest people in the tech industry. Uh, like, you know, VCs and all them. They, they, that's who reads him every morning. So he's got to come with like f- original content that's super smart about the same topics. He's been doing this for like a decade and he makes $3 million a year roughly doing this off his paid. And he only charges $120 stuff. a year. Yeah, I think he upped his price. I don't know what it is now, but he like did raise his prices at some it's point. It's $120. I'm, it's $12 yeah, I think it was 100 and now it's 120 <laughs> Oh my gosh. Like he needs to this guy is like insane. $1,000 a month uh, for this thing. You know, but, but he's, you know, I think Ben's awesome. Uh, so I don't read it as a knock for him. I'm saying I would hate the pressure of the daily, super insightful thing that I have to write every every morning, original content about like the same kind of like ten companies is uh, I don't I literally don't even know how he does it. If somebody had told me they're going to do that, I'd be like, "What are you saying? This makes no sense." And uh, he does it every day, sitting in Taiwan. This is the worst. This is the worst. <laughs> I, it, it is it is amazing, um, but um, yeah, I would never want to do this. Um, so, what do we think? That I wonder what I want to know the listener if they think that these one all in depth on one topic. If they dig this, if they dig the award category style or the award style. What do you think? Yeah, this is, is an this experiment for us of like doing a few focused episodes, themed episodes. So today's theme was these one or two person businesses that crush it. Um, do you like this or do you like the freestyle? Freestyle is a lot easier. This one takes a lot of work. But if people love this, you got to go in the YouTube comments and show us if we should do more of these or no. Uh, we're cool either way, but this is an experiment. So let us know in the YouTube comments. Dude, I stressed out for so long doing this. These these are these are emotional for me. Can, I get stressed out. Can I out. give some takeaways? Because I don't think we did that. Uh, I think we should do some takeaways. Yeah. All right. So here's my, my quick takeaways. The most common industries you see these one to two person businesses that crush are... Uh, just like thought leader on on social media. So just putting out free content on social media. E-commerce. We didn't do any e-com ones in this, but like there's a bunch of e-commerce there's businesses that could do like, you know, a million dollars a year in profit that are run with one or two people. And then ag- you can do agencies for everything else. Um, games. So we talked about Stardew Valley, Minecraft. There's a bunch of games that are built like this. Um, apps, apps and plugins. So plugins on top of things like a Figma plugin, a Google Sheets plugin, a Gmail plugin. That sort of thing. And then data aggregators like built with, which are basically like compiling data like mill.com, compiling a bunch of things that are of the same thing. So it's you go search and you find what you want uh, because they've aggregated everything. Only finder, same thing. It's a data aggregator. Um, strategy. So here's a couple strategy points. You need to be either amazing, 100% awesome at distribution, meaning you're the influencer, you're the content creator, or you need to be 100% awesome on product. You're the guy coding the game and 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 you'll you'll hire a publisher to do the publishing. And so I think that if I was going to do this, if I was going to try to make this happen, I would say where can I be either an incredible at distribution or incredible at product and I want to just like put all of my emphasis on that um in order to make this happen. The next one. You need attributes. So a lot of these we made sound simple, but you got to have some attributes, some skill, copywriting, design, uh 
you know, the ability, like investment judgment, market analysis, like you got to be expert on one of these things if you're going to make this happen. And so, you know, you got to get to that expert master, master of your craft level if you're going to do this. Uh, the last one, it's all about leverage. So the way you can get a one or two person company to get to millions, tens of millions, or even some of the examples we gave were hundreds of millions of dollars um, was leverage. So you need to be using code, uh, build it once, and then it runs as software. You need to use um, media like podcasts or newsletters or whatever. Um, or you need to use capital because you're not going to use labor, right? Like most companies use labor. That's why they have hundreds of people working for them. But if you're going to not have hundreds of people working, you got to use these other forms of leverage, code, capital, some money, or media are, are your tools of choice. So you got to figure out which of those three can I use? And that's how I'm going to do it. And the beauty of it is because of the internet, if you're the best at X, you now get to sell to the whole world. So like we didn't give an example, Miss Excel. So Miss Excel is this girl who goes on TikTok and she, in a high energy way, dances and tells it teaches you how to use Excel, like Microsoft Excel better. And she's the best in the world at teaching Excel. It turns out the best in the world at teaching Excel is, you know how to do the pop, you know, the, the useful stuff and you can dance. Turns out that's what the best teacher of Excel looked like. And she now gets to teach the entire world Excel. Like the best of anything gets to, gets to provide that product service or education to everybody. That's the beauty of, of the internet. And so you need to figure out how to become the best of X because, and then just make it available to everybody. And the last thing I, I was going to say was, it's fucking lonely. Like the best times that I have in work is when I'm, whether it's in the trenches and like it's a shitty day or it's a great day, is celebrating with coworkers. These jobs are lonely. I'm actually surprised when I hear about this, about like how they are able to push. Like I push myself because, oh, I have mouths to feed or I want to be held accountable by these other people and make them proud. It's really hard to push yourself this hard and to think big when you're by yourself. And it's just hard to do this every day alone. So hopefully you have like a good spouse or a significant other or something because this shit's challenging. 100% when you're by agree. I immediately, I, when I started this, I was like, oh, I want to be a solo, solopreneur. I wanted to be a solopreneur or they call it a solo capitalist. I raised a fund and it's like, I want to be a solo capitalist. And I was like, oh, this isn't fun at all to do this by yourself. Yeah. And not only is it not that good to do things by yourself because, you know, a little bit of help can go a long way. A complimentary person who's good at the things you're not good at is really, really useful. But on top of that, it ain't no fun. And like most of life is the journey, not the destination. And you don't want to have the shitty journey for this awesome destination. And so very quickly, I was like, yeah, this is a duopreneur. This is me and Ben doing this or in the fun. It's me and Ramin doing this. And I basically immediately was like, I'm going to do this. Even my e-com business, I gave a chunk of it to a guy who was smarter than me and had done this before and would give me some money. And I was like, why? Just because like, I don't want to be reporting into myself and only like have myself as a thought partner to be sparring with on ideas about this. I want to have somebody awesome just, just to do some you know idea jousting on this. And so uh, I think doing it by yourself is honestly a terrible idea. And you should definitely try to get one other person to do this. I think two people is the, is the sweet spot where you get sort of the, the, the most autonomy and the least like management headaches. And you have... Uh, you still get the most shit done and have a lot of fun along the way. All right. That's the pod. Whether you're listening on iTunes or Spotify or whatever, go to uh, search My First Million on YouTube and go to the comments on this video and actually let us know. We'll read them and see if we should keep doing these. That's it. Yeah. I feel like I can rule the world. I know I could be what I want to. Uh, I put my all in it like no days off. On the road, let's travel. Never looking back. Like